Hello, everyone. Hello, if you're wanting to join us. I know there's a lot of yummy food out there. So I don't want to be the guy who stands between you and the food, but there will be more later. Yeah. Welcome. Welcome to the Magnus Collection of Jewish Art and Life. My name is Francesco Spaniola. I'm the curator of the collection and also the curator of the exhibition that we're celebrating uh, today. It's a delight to see everybody here. And um, I want to start just by uh, giving a few thank yous, some institutional thank yous and some really curatorial thank yous. Uh, in, institutionally, this exhibition had direct support from the Friends of the Magnus, the Magnus Museum Foundation and Toby Philanthropy, so we're particularly grateful uh, to all of them for their ongoing support and for the support for this specific project. It's a special project. Uh, we'll discuss it in various ways today, but again, before I start, I just wanna, some of the people I'm thanking, I'm also thanking because they're here and, and speaking, uh, speaking today, but uh, colleagues from UC Berkeley, uh, Greg Niemeyer uh, from the Department of Art Practice, and uh, uh, Professor Lawrence Cohen from uh, Anthropology, a medical anthropologist, uh, both consulted with me as I was uh, curating this exhibition. So did Dr. Lisa Danzig, who will close the program today. And um, a special thank you, he couldn't join us. Poor thing, he's spending uh, high holidays and the fall in Florence, Italy, Rabbi Yoel Khan. So he couldn't be here today, but I know he's here with us in rabbinical spirit. And, um, and I turned to him right away as I was planning this work as I was taking in the biography, the extraordinary biography and tra biographical trajectory of, of uh, Ori Sherman, the artist we're celebrating today. And Richard Schwarzenberger, who was Ori's partner and who's opening the, the conversation today, so will be speaking shortly after me. They, all of them have helped me in various ways. And also want to acknowledge the donor of the artwork to the Magnus, uh, Charles M. Little of San Francisco, who acquired the work and donated it to the Magnus in 2006. So obviously, this exhibition would not be possible without that gift. As you know, the Magnus, on an ongoing basis, works with donors, not just to support our activities, but also to increase our collection. And if you're familiar with the history of collecting at the Magnus, you know that over the last several years, the Magnus brought into its collections two of the four largest gifts of art in the history of the University of California, Berkeley. I also want to thank our faculty director who's not here. He's giving a talk, as we speak, he's giving a talk in New York City, Professor John Efren, uh, who's been a constant support throughout this project. And this project also benefited from um, translations from our campus colleague, Professor Robert Alter, who translated the entire Hebrew Bible into English, a phenomenal translation. So when you visit the gallery, all the translations of the Hebrew text are from his, uh, his incredible work. And dear friend, musical colleague, and often partner in crime, Rabbi Ruben Zellman, who I hope is in the room. He was here earlier. I don't know if you are. Yeah, if you can stand up, Ruben. So we, you can acknowledge Ruben's, <laughs> Ruben, Ruben's poem. Ruben's poem is part of, of the installation. It's a very, very dear poem, to, dear to me and to many, I think to many. Uh, not just in the Bay Area, far beyond, and it's an honor to have his work included in this project. Project that would not have started without the essential input of my beloved colleague, Julie Franklin, Registrar and Collection Manager of the Magnus. Julie, are you there? Another <laughs> applause. I'm sorry, I'm getting through all the applauses now so that we can then really tackle the exhibition, but Julie, we were considering various projects, she, she brought again uh, or this, this specific cycle of paintings, Ari Sherman's uh, creation, to my attention, and that's when certain wheels started to turn and this whole project became the exhibition we're celebrating today. Uh, speaking of this exhibition and, and, and of the program today, we have a program that will include words by Richard Schwarzenegger, I'm uh, sorry, not Schwarzenegger, <laughs> Schwarzenberger, all right, not the same at all. That's, that's, a, that's an interesting one. Okay, I go into the little closet of shame and come back. Richard will speak about Ori and his life and, and, and 
and artistic trajectory. Uh, we have a, a colleague from campus, uh, Dr. Justin Underhill, talking about artwork and doing some digital magic uh, with, with Ori's, uh, Ori Sherman's work. And Dr. Lisa Danzig, an epidemiologist, and also somebody who's been very close to this project from its inception. And we'll hear words about the role of art and in printing in our society. So we, we're in for a set of treats. And um, today's date is a special date for this project. Ori Sherman, who grew up in a religiously observant Jewish family in Brooklyn, he was born in, in, in uh, Jerusalem, uh, was very close, not just to the words of the Torah, to the Torah itself, this project shows it very intimately. And the words of the Genesis were part of the parasha, or the biblical portion that he read on his bar mitzvah. Those words are read on what is called Shabbat Bereshit, the, the first Shabbat in the reading cycle of the Bible of the year which was marked yesterday uh, in synagogues throughout the world. So we're, we're also marking this occasion in very close connection with uh, the trajectory of, this, of the project in, in the exhibition. And what he did is what I called in the exhibition, I called visual Torah. By visual Torah, I do not mean illustration of the Hebrew Bible, I mean almost like a, a concept that stands together with, we're, we're familiar with the concept of the oral law, the oral Torah, of the written Torah. In a way, it's visual commentary on the Bible itself. So I wanna just point you to a couple of things that inspired my work here. We see how the creation of the world is illustrated with the Hebrew words themselves. So the words are painted on the paintings, and in some ways it feels like the world is emerging, is being created from the words itself. This, in, this is in itself a very important rabbinic idea, idea. and in, uh, in uh, many ways, visual Torah means explanation, commentary, expanding, expanding the, 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 the semantic field of the, of the Hebrew Bible itself. Uh, this is one example. The other things that we, and we see how really the world in all of its part emerges directly. It's created from the words themselves. The other thing that you see here is, um, let me see if I can use my pointer, is you see that the name of God is always illustrated in various ways. You saw it here on parchment and again on parchment here. It's the four letter name of God. But this is a name and in a way, a God that changes identity as the world is being created. So when the, the natural world and plants are created, the, word, the four letters of the name of God become vegetable themselves. You will find, so I invite you at the end of the program to, if you have a chance to still take in the exhibition and go and look for all these incredible details that show deep thinking, deep knowledge of Torah, steep, being steeped in tradition, and at the same time finding one's voice in relating to it. Um, this is an example of that. It's uh, not really part of the narrative that it happens in the following chapter than the one that's illustrated here in chapter two. It's the, 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 the consume, consuming of the forbidden fruit. And as you will see in, in Ori Sherman's depiction, both Adam and Eve are picking the forbidden fruits. So it's, a, it's sort of like, a, let's, let's put it this way, we're in the Bay Area, it's a gender inclusive <laughs> approach to, 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 the, to the original sin, right? And, and to, to the role that humankind has in our, in our, in our world. Um, other images that are present there are drawn from Jewish mysticism. This is one example you see at the center of this is what, it, what is called a Ouroboros. It's a, it's a mystical symbol, it's a snake that bites its tail, it, it, it indicates circularity and continuity. We find this is one example on the right of, your, of the screen here from, from the Magnus collection. It's a, it's a decoration for the sukkah, for the, for the holiday of Sukkot. Um, and uh, it's early modern and we see the same symbol here. So in other words, this artwork is also very much part of the collection in every possible way and it was presented in the exhibition uh, this way. Um, one element that remains, as all art is, 
a beautiful question mark for all of us, but also inspired our work is that has Ori Sherman um, painted the words and the, the world of the creation on its seventh day. He depicted something that looks like a virus, not just to us, but I've consulted with colleagues. One of them is speaking today and a medical anthropologist who helped me research how the vi viruses were imagined in the 1980s. We didn't have microscopic photography that went down at that level. We'll hear more about this, but this has been another generating an inspiring moment in curating this exhibition and feeling that this is an exhibition that speaks to us on many, many levels, including speaks to us from the height of the AIDS pandemic, which is still ongoing, 40 years in, 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 its, in its history this year, and speaks to us and has a lot to teach. So the idea that not only the world is created from the words of the Hebrew Bible, but that created world also includes viruses is something that we've come to terms collectively uh, in, in our recent uh, history, in our present, but that clearly a segment of our population was facing very dramatically uh, decades ago, and uh, something that bec remained very, very dear, very, very dear uh, to us. Um, last but not least is the title of the exhibition in Twilight. Um, Ori Sherman also painted a sun with an ocean and a sky. I'm using these generic terms because actually we do not know, the same way that we don't know whether that image before was really a virus, we don't know whether this is a sunrise or a sunset. And in a way it's both. And it's the whole trajectory of, of the cycle of paintings is painted with this idea of being in between. And so the concept of twilight arose and it was beautifully represented in the design by Carol Jung, who's also here in the room today. So thank you, Carol, for doing that. Um, something that's not written, you know, there are all kinds of things in exhibitions that are not really explained. They just, they're just there. And one of them is that in the exhibition, you will say, well, actually also it's accompanied by the poem I was mentioning earlier by, by Rabbi Ruben Zellman, Twilight People, which I invite you to take and read. It's also posted online so you can actually digitally take it with you um, with permission by Rabbi Zellman, he's giving his permission right now, this second. And, uh, and um, in the gallery, a reproduction and large reproduction of this sunset sunrise is positioned in front of a Torah scroll. Ori Sherman, the artist, read from a Torah these words. The Torah is there because it informs everything that happens in the gallery. But it's also, if it's positioned this way in front of a, of a sun, then if it, it evokes also the world of the synagogue. And in that case, this would be a sunrise because synagogues tend to face east. So the sun is rising in front of it. As you take in the, the gallery, you will see that the original work is positioned exactly opposite. So the west side of, of the gallery in this reconstructed, reimagined world of the exhibition installation. This is one, another example of the, the various details that emerged in, in this work. And the team that put it together, team of museum professionals, colleagues, academic colleagues, other people who just contributed their ideas and their, their feelings, their, their, their thoughts about all of this. All of this kind of came together in this exhibition that we're delighted to present today. So thank you for being here. And um, I am really, really happy to introduce Richard. Uh, Richard Schwarzenberger was Ori's companion as he painted these works and in the last uh, part of his life. And uh, you've been, Richard, a constant inspiration throughout, throughout this whole process. I'm really delighted to have you here. So please join me in welcoming Richard Schwarzenberger <laughs> to the podium. And thank you. Okay, um, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, good. Um, thank you, Francesco. Thank you, Lauren and Laura and Julie and all the, all the people here at the Magnus for uh, this wonderful occasion. It's very touching. Um, I, I have been asked to talk a little bit about my personal connection to Ori 
as well as give you a sense of the history of when and how the work that you see in the next room was created. Um, so first I'll talk about the personal connection. Well, I met Ori, I think it was around 1978, which seems in retrospect as really an age of innocence. Um, he complimented me, at, it was at a party, and he complimented me about the way I passed a tray of hors d'oeuvres around. <laughs> he was flirting. I never forget a compliment, and I did not forget him. We met again just by chance at a gay bar in the Castro called the Midnight Sun, and um, at breakfast the next morning, let's skip to the next, um, <laughs> at Herb's Fine Foods. <laughs> We have some personal connections to her side who there. <laughs> he said, um, he announced, I have a boyfriend, right before asking me what I was doing tomorrow night. <laughs> it was the 70s. The, the arrangement that we had from the get-go was he would always come to my place. I never went to his place, where he lived with his boyfriend, Dominic. And it went on like that until I moved to South Carolina in 1980, in January of 1980. By December, I was back in San Francisco, San Francisco living in a flat on Belvedere Street with Ori, Dominic, and their roommate, Carletta. The early 80s were a period of time in which I still had the illusion that AIDS would not deeply affect me or my loved ones. There was plenty else to worry about. Our flat became the home base for the nuclear weapons banner campaign, an offshoot of the larger nuclear freeze movement. Our mission, as Ori wrote in a three-page call to action, was to put up large banners around town with anti-nuke statements. Quote, the vision is a daring one. This land covered with banners proclaiming our desire for peace. The one hanging on the facade of our house I think it's gonna come up here in a minute, read ban nuclear weapons in large letters, and below that, if not now, when? If not us, who? We didn't quite cover the land, but we put up a lot of banners on buildings and across the intersections in the hate. There were two on Mendel's, one on the Grand Piano Cafe, one across the width of Stanyan Street, a wonderful, fo wonderful photograph in the Chronicle showed a pair of policemen on horses crossing Ashbury Street under a banner stenciled with a quote from Gandhi. Almost anything you do will be insignificant, but it is very important that you do it. The inspiration and energy for the banner campaign was largely Ori's. He was a passionate man, half primitive, half rabbi. He, his laugh lift up, lit up a room. His anger was quick and hot. His sister Varda told me that by the age of four, he had the whole family terrorized. <laughs> he said once, I prefer, to do it, I prefer to do it my way, even if it's wrong. Get it out was scriptural imperative. Early in the onset of his illness, he had a dream in which he was pulling colored balloons out of the ground with some difficulty. A voice loud enough to wake him said, you will only get well when you plumb the depths of your creativity. He knew the dream did not mean that his body would be healed. The dream was about his soul. He ended his longtime employment as a designer of elaborate custom picture frames and began to make a living painting ketubah and other ceremonial documents. In the time between commissions, he finished a children's book based on the four questions recited at the Passover Seder. All attempts by him and his better connected twin brother in New York to find an agent to represent the work stalled. The four questions stayed in a box. He turned his attention to another project, the one we see next, in the room next door. In April of 1987, the year before his death in 1988, the show Ill Illuminations, the Artistry of Ori Sherman, featuring documents he had painted, opened at the Jewish Community Museum of San Francisco 
By then, he had completed four of the paintings of the creation series. This was a, um, a little booklet that they did at, at that time. And anybody's welcome to look at this after, uh, after the presentation. Meanwhile, the ominous rumbles in the background had become a persistent roar. Where he was convinced he had the virus, that he could feel it making changes in his body. I poo-pooed the idea. Hypochondria. His Merck Manual, a medical reference book, was a well-thumbed prayer book and oracle for him. Then the first actual diagnosis, AIDS-related condition, ARC. I took that as a hopeful diagnosis when it was, in fact, my last big drag on illusion that we could get off this path. Medications multiplied as it did stays in the hospital. I once came home with another report of some dubious treatment. It might have been ozone therapy. And he stopped me cold. You don't understand. I want out. Death did not scare him. Death was a theme in his work from, Rhode, from the Rhode Island School of Design, where he went to school, up to the time of his own death. Skulls were practically an ornamental feature in his 70s paintings. There are some, th these are some of the titles from his life work. Death of the Emperor, Dead Horses, Totentons, Beckoning Death, Ritual with Dead Fish, Death on Stage, Death is Blue, Death is a Clown. In those days, I worked every Thursday as a gardener for a retired couple, the Maccabees, in the hills of Berkeley. Their own children were far away. They treated me like a substitute son. One day they were expecting their daughter, Gina, to arrive from New York. She was late. They stretched out lunch so that I could meet her. Just about as, as I was about to give up to go home, she and her husband arrived. Gina was a literary agent. I told Ori about her. I, I had mentioned his work, and she had agreed to look at it. Months passed. Then in the fall, the phone rang. It was Gina. She asked to speak to Ori. Ori was in bed with the flu or something worse. I was not sure he could even talk to her, but he did. Her news at the Munich Book Fair, Arthur Levine of Dial Press had fallen in love with the four questions. Dial wanted more paintings, a cover, a frontispiece, an illustrated glossary of the contents of the Seder plate, and several incidentals. Could he do them? Or he leveled with Gina about the state of his health. He promised to give it his best, but he made no other promises. The news was the best medicine. He knocked out the requested paintings without a hitch or hesitation, like a musician who has put in the hours and hours of preparation. And I suppose a lot of you know this book, so. That accomplished, he turned his attention back to the creation. He began to doubt he'd be able to finish it. In December of 1987, he wrote to Barbara Osher, who was one of his clients. With so much I still want to do and with limited energies with which to do it, I must pick and choose daily the most critical matters to attend to. One of those matters is to finish up, if at all possible, the creation series. I started, it is slow, meticulous work in the best of times. Now it's like inching up the sheer side of a cliff, one small step at a time, but I am grateful to even do that. His bad days outnumbered the reprieves with recurrent fevers, the body putting up its final defenses. Here is an example of how he worked. One evening, his temperature over 104, he lay on his bed, semi-conscious, his arms swatting away imaginary projectiles. The rule was fixed. No more hospitals, no matter what. With a washcloth soaked in ice water, I rubbed him down, trying to lower the fever. It would not come down. Hours passed. At th around three in the morning, I told him I had to go lie down. He said, go ahead, I'll be fine. I think the fever is about to break soon. I passed out, awakening an hour or two later in a panic that he might have died while I slept. I rushed into his room. 
He was in his bathrobe, sitting on his, sorry, sitting on his stool, bent over the sixth day of creation, his wisp of a paintbrush making a steady, delicate line. He said, I thought I better work while I can. If not now, when? In March of 1988, he said, I see in myself a great clarity. I know who I am. I don't feel frantic about these things. Whatever drops into that framework, I can assimilate. I just feel that I have at this point a structure that is fitting and comfortable and will see me through. He finished the creation, then like the third movement of the symphony, Dial requested a Hanukkah book. Once more, Ori rose to the task. In an unbelievable 10 days, the paintings of the story of Hanukkah flowed into being. He put down the brush then. He was done. The final movement, rest in silence. I'll show you that. And I'm sure some of you have seen this book too. This is beautiful. Ori's name translates, my light. He wrote, legend tells us that the completed creation did not really exist until it was named. I felt that way about myself too, that my real life started with my naming. It's so moving to see his light shining here today. Thank you. Just a couple, so first of all, thank you, Richard. Thank you so much. Uh, really your inspiration throughout this process the last several months has been invaluable. And um, as a reminder, Richard is a, as he mentioned, a gardener and an author in San Francisco. And uh, a very, very special human as we all learned. So really special to have you here. Uh, equally meaningful, so I met Justin as in Dr. Underhill, uh, when he was a PhD student here and doing really incredible, mad, like literally magical things in, in digital art history. And um, he came to visit the show as it was still being mounted and it was clear that it was a, a match in, in having him, in, so I, I managed to snatch him and, and, and get him here on a Sunday. Um, Justin has a PhD in art history from UC Berkeley and he's the director of the Visualization Lab of Digital Art History here on campus called also the V-Lab, the V-Lab. And uh, just to give you an example, this coming week there will be a class visit that he has engineered with students in art history to visit the exhibition and discuss its, uh, its production. And then we are having on Thursday morning an online digital uh, lab, essentially based on, on the works of, of this exhibition. So there's more happening and more that we expect will continue to happen around this exhibition. Please uh, join me to welcome Justin Underhill. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's an honor to be here. Can everyone hear me sufficiently? Great. I wanted to start with two timelines. One should look more familiar to you than the other. On the left, you have a timeline from 2013 of the AIDS epidemic. Um, I had been already been HIV positive about 10 years when I first saw this, uh, this uh, timeline. And I'm only showing it to you because it's very familiar and you'll see it kind of at the very top, we have 1981, the appearance of the disease. And then interspersed, we have famous celebrities who died of the disease and difficult to pronounce names of drugs that are being released up until the present moment. On the right, I'm showing you a timeline which is much more close to the lived reality of becoming H finding out one is HIV positive in the 1980s. It's a timeline of transmission and death of the virus in the first 11 years of its uh, transmission. And you can see that in the years between 87 and 91, the um, 
transmission rate is starting to really pull ahead of the death rate. So this is a time when we really get aware that we're entering the plague years. The first time I ever heard of HIV was in 1988 on a special of Mr. Belvedere, one of those horrible 80s shows in which for about 30 seconds, the music gets really soft and you hear about something of great social significance, usually domestic violence, drugs, or HIV. And then the world goes on in its happy kind of clangorous beat. I began studying art and HIV because I became aware that my lived experience keyed me into certain aspects of the art produced in this time that otherwise went unremarked or the iconography was lost. And when we look at the type of art being produced in these years between 80 and, 80 and 93, we see art that's highly confrontational and often uses pop culture imagery. It's immediate. It's meant to hit you like a, blow, a billboard. So here I'm showing you one of the most famous examples. It's in the um, kind of window shopping display of a museum and it was created by ACT UP the AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power. Um, you can see at the top left, silence equals death, the most famous logo of the epidemic uh, created by Grand Fury the year before. And as one walked up to this display, as one walked up to this display, a uh, set of lights in the foreground would illuminate uh, cultural figures from the United States um, placed in front of um, the Nuremberg trials along with quotes. So here I'm reading one. Quarantine or isolation is the only possible health, public health control measure. Uh, sounds very familiar in our own time. Another one, I confess that I always had intellectual difficult, had difficulty interpreting the biblical precinct, uh, biblical uh, precept to love our neighbors as yourself. That's Margaret Thatcher. <laughs> and I should say the quarantine uh, remark was from a US state senator. Um, and I have friends who vividly remember going to anti-quarantine rallies and events when it was discussed that we should all just be herded up in one way or another. In line with this kind of confrontational billboard style, we see artists like Keith Haring, whose commercial popularity remains today. This is a uh, mural on the side of a museum that I reconstructed. Uh, it was placed there in 2013. Uh, in the top left, you'll see this is originally the, the plaza. This mural was installed by Herring, Herring in, and it was a plaza in Spain that was known for um, heroin dealing. And so it was a transmission vector. And so by having this kind of anti-AIDS message where AIDS is a snake, and people are dying who are uh, hearing no evil, speaking no evil, or seeing no evil. Um, it's an immediate image that you can kind of decipher within a few minutes. And my actual encounter with Ori's work was many years ago, but it was a similar type of immediate effect, a set of uh, illustrations that he had done um, for a book called AIDS, pra AIDS, Principles, Practices, and Politics that showed the disease as a dragon. So we have him in a vial, we had it lurking in the background while three normal people discuss their life. And here we have attempts to vanquish it as it takes more victims on its back. But I began thinking after I saw this show that I don't, besides this kind of confrontational media aesthetic, we don't see a lot of meditations on the natural world or time and becoming. It's all this kind of immediate billboard confrontation. The only other image I was able to find that kind of meditated on the natural world and creation was actually very depressing. It was a um, late 80s uh, collage by David Wojnarowicz that I'm showing you here of a street dog he had seen in Mexico juxtaposed with two full moons. And in Western iconography, we see a long-standing tradition. This is an uh, math, math, uh, optics textbook, science textbook from the 17th century by the second most famous scientist after Galileo. And you can see here in this astronomy textbook, optics, we see that lunar cycles are making dogs lunatics. They're driving them crazy. And so here we have this starving dog beneath two, two full moons, this image of nature gone out of cycle. And it's still just sitting there starving. It's not affected. It's not howling at the moon. There's no lycanthropy. You know, we have a deep tradition of werewolves coming alive at the full moon. This dog's just sitting there literally hang dog and starving. This image hung above Wojnarowicz's deathbed the last three weeks of his life. I wanted, to 
to think about this relationship between humans and nature and the space that the show creates, this imaginary east-west access that links the Torah before us to Jerusalem far away, and this amazing dim space with the wall spotlit that one's eyes have to slowly adjust to like a romantic landscape painting. The first romantic landscape painters had very similar conditions to the exhibition you're gonna see in there where your eye really had to take time to adjust to the light and get close to these images to understand what's going on. Rabbi Zelman talks about the in-between time that's orchestrated in this exhibit. And I've often been fascinated by the way that our, our eyes respond to twilight, that half an hour before sunrise and sunset when the sun approaches uh, the horizon. Uh, we're after the vernal equinox, so we're right about here in the solar cycle. At twilight, something really amazing happens to our sense of color. Uh, it's called the Purkinje effect. It was actually discovered about 300 years ago by a painter. And as the rods in our eyes become less adept at picking up the falling light, the cones, which are responsible for color, they start trying to do some of the heavy lifting. And I'm showing you from top to bottom a simulation of how color affects our, our perception of twilight. We become much less um, sensitive to reds and warm colors and much more sensitive to cool colors, blues and greens. They begin to pop. And artists for thousands of years have taken, uh, made use of this. Um, here I'm showing you a Mesoamerican work of art, which at the summer solstice, when it was viewed in tw twilight, the jaguar, which is a symbol of the underworld, was seen to leap off the surface of the image. Leonardo once had a very, very difficult, deep, dark commissioned space, and he painted the virgins of the rocks such that that blue in very dim light that defines heaven and the virgin mantle would seem to also pop or engulf the viewer as they pray. One thing I'd like everyone to keep in mind when they're looking at these amazing images is the work that we have to do when we're looking at color and texture. Um, gouache is a very difficult medium to work with because it takes a strong degree of planning, unlike watercolor. I'll distribute these slides afterwards so that people can look at them. Uh, we, in watercolor, we have to work from light to dark, and it's very unforgiving. Gouache allows for a lot more planning because you can rework it. It has like kind of whiteout built into it. Um, but you cannot build from light to dark. Um, on the left and right, I'm showing you the comparison between gouache and watercolor. And you can see that you can get much more saturation and detail because you can overpaint um, darker and lighter onto that surface. The gouache in this is so amazing to me because no matter how closely one looks, we're always drawn further into the surfaces that define these paintings. Um, ribbons especially of blue and green that never fully yield the surface they're supposed to suggest. Our eye can always go deeper into a vapor or an atmosphere, but it also gets challenged by loopings and outlines that seem to define the object next to it just as pr profoundly as it defines what it seems to be. Another wonderful trick I noticed in looking at these paintings is um, something called isoluminance. We have two different parts of our brain that uh, process the visual world. One is for light and dark, and it's many, many hundreds of millions of years old. The other one is much younger, and we share it with some of our hominid relatives, um, that, we use to that we use to process color. And when two colors that have the same level of brightness but different hues uh, are juxtaposed in a painting, they seem to have a magical shimmering quality. If you look at this uh, black and white version of Monet's Impression Sunrise from 1872, you can see that you can barely see the sun in the black and white version. But because our color system processes it differently, we have to, our eye wants to return over and over to this uh, chromatic contrast. And I pointed out, so I picked up some other wonderful examples of isoluminance in Ori's work. Whenever one 
goes to a show like this, um, there's one painting that they kind of always return to. And for me, it's this painting that, that, that closes out, one of the paintings that closes out the show. Um, this was a time when the earliest images of the HIV virus were being uh, uh, investigated. I'm actually showing you in the bottom right-hand corner, this is um, a closely related uh, retrovirus called the HTLV virus that was photographed uh, a few years before Ori's death. And um, this is the first diagram of an HIV virus based off of these images. And you can see there's a close uh, attention to detail with attempt to get the, the, the central body, but also the corona or the, ex the exterior parts. Roland Barthes once said that every painting has a punctum, a place that your eye returns over and over. And for me, that's this virus that's floating in this void that someone looks like two different registers of Monet's, wa Monet's water lilies, one on top of another. And our eye can never fully differentiate this kind of ever unfolding space. It shines there like a beacon that I can't fully get my eye or my brain around. And I think that might be the work of an artwork that explores AIDS at this point of time. Um, the last person I lost to HIV was my friend Bruce. And in the final moments of his life, I said, what, what, do, you, what do you want me to do for you? And he said, um, Every once in a while, just think of me and remember me. And I did that uh, today. And I'm very grateful for this show. And I'd just like to um, thank Francesco from the bottom of my heart for putting this together. Um, so I want to give a shameless plug now that I'm done being sad. I was raised Protestant, so the truth makes me cry. I'm sorry. Um, uh, on Thursday, we're going to, uh, in my lab, we're going to have a great event with undergraduates, graduate students, any members of the public uh, allowed. A graduate student in data science is going to teach us how to use some really cool image processing software to measure light and color in paintings. And we're going to do it with Ori Kubla. It's going to be amazing. Um, and this is an example of the software. So this is every image from Time Life shown according to how bright and dark and hue saturated it is. Hundreds of years. And just playing around with Ori's work in the show, we did the same thing and found that there's three different color and chromatic clusters. And we're going to explore how that works with the narrative of their sheet. Um, I'm not going to ruin it. I'm not going to explain any more, because if you want to know, you have to come. Uh, if you hold up your phone to this QR code, you can get the link. Um, this is the most beautiful show I've ever seen put together. I'm an art historian. I, Yes, and uh, Francesco will also have the information, and we'll, we'll record it for folks who can't make it. Um, but I just have to say that this is the most beautiful show. Um, getting wonderful, wonderful art is one thing, but putting it together in a way that is meaningful and phenomenologically significant and does justice to the work is a totally different thing. So thank you so much. This has made my weekend, made my month. Cheers. Yes, Justin, that was okay. <laughs> yes, it was. Uh, just just as, as before I introduce our last speaker, another amazing human, Justin, you, 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 you heard him, uh, who recently celebrated his 40th birthday by volunteering at an orphanage in Ukraine. So just, just to know what's going on here today. And the same is true for our last speaker, so it's really wonderful to have you all. You didn't know each other before this, so hopefully new friendships will come out of this. Lisa Danzig was actually the first person I went to when, I, when this idea and the realization of a possible depiction of a virus in this work. And so the, the, the link between the artwork and the AIDS pandemic was emerging. Uh, Lisa is, is an infectious disease specialist and has been involved with 
epidemics around the globe for many, many years, from AIDS to Ebola to, to she was, you know, among other things, that sounds glamorous, but it's, it's real stuff. She was on the team that set the protocols for the Academy Awards. She gave protocols for the state of Hawaii for people flying in and out when we're all in lockdown. Uh, she helped the country of Peru figure out what to do, et cetera, et cetera. So we're really honored to have you here. Uh, she's, she's a giant in her field. And I went to her saying, wait a second, I'm doing this with the pandemic. Am I, am I, am I somewhere on target? And she was like, yes, you are. Yes, you are. So this is what she's here for, to explain to us what we can do with all of this and all of these ideas that we've heard and the history that we have. In this, in this artwork. So thank you, Lisa Danzig, Dr. Lisa Danzig, for speaking today, and welcome. And uh, it's an honor to be here and to participate in this stunning show, and I do feel a little bit underqualified. Um, I was, am an infectious disease doc, and I started working in San Francisco in 1990, so from, I, I've been around and I've seen it, but we're here to talk about the work. In 1908, um, this is an artist's rendering of the biology of reproduction, painted in 1908 by Klimt, who frequented salons with scientists, including Zuckerkandl, who had a microscope and was looking at the origins of biology. He looked at sperm and, and fertilization under the microscope. And we see this, the title of this painting is The Kiss. Shown side by side with the images from the microscope, you see sperm, you see fertilization, you see um, gametogenesis. This is a, a human organism, so this is life. and and. And it was interesting to me because when you showed me the images of Ori's work, I felt that I was seeing images of death, beautiful images of death. Here are the beautiful images of the beginning of life. Rendered in the style that we were able to see with the technology available at the time. In the 1980s, this is what we saw. This is what we understood about HIV. So in the top left is a normal immune cell with the fil normal filaments, and, and on the right is one infected by HIV. So we see a loss of function, and we see these little things blebbing. It's an infected cell that has viruses budding out with a detail underneath. With the transition, uh, the transmission electron microscope, we have even better resolution of these little virus buds and the little spikes or the crowns underneath. During the recent pandemic, and, and here is this lovely, exquisite image on the seventh day of creation when God rested and the virus came out. We learned firsthand in the last several years the importance of understanding risk and the consequences of failing to respond. In a climate of mistrust, sown by myths and disinformation, and fueled by political agendas and bad actors, we often turn to art as trusted messengers to foster a sense of risk literacy. Imprinting and learned behavior endures beyond the initial threat or consequence of a loss. And we've seen this with mask use and adoption in countries that had been affected by SARS. So you look at Singapore, you look at Taiwan and Hong Kong, as soon as they heard there was a virus, there were lines out for masks. Everybody put their mask on. This, th these were countries that were immune to fake news because the real virus went viral first. And in these times of crisis, as with the earlier pandemic with HIV, 
a virus that was met with, with stigma and denial and, and vilification and ignorance. We turn to art as messenger. And so I wonder, what was Mr. Sherman telling us with this work? Thank you very much for coming to, to participate in this important show. Um, yeah, well, thank you everybody for being here. I, I don't think I have much to add. I, you know, we tried to, we tried to offer a, a program that would touch and direct us in many different ways. And I think we still have some food and drinks and definitely we have a lot of art on view. So, and the speakers are here. So I think they're, they're, your additional questions are welcome to them. But I would use this time to just be together with the art, with the Magnus, and uh, we're available to you if you have any questions for us. Thank you so, so much for being here today. Thank you.